भद्रम कर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येक्षजत्रा स्थिरंगुष्टवागु सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्धश्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्ववेदा स्वस्ति नस्ताक्षो अरिष्टने स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शाति 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 So in our study of the Mandukya Upanishad and the Mandukya Karikas we had come to the uh, 23rd to 21st Karika and uh, now we have to do 22nd and 23rd Karikas remember the background that um, the Upanishad said there are two kinds of inquiries to take up one is the inquiry into the self into what am i and that enquiry a particular procedure was suggested by the upanishad look at your experiences you will find you have three kinds of experiences broadly speaking common to our day to day life uh, a waking experience where we experience a physical universe i am the knower and i experience a physical universe a dream experience where this physical universe is for the time being erased from my awareness but i experience a world of thoughts constructed of of uh, my mind and remember it's it's a world of thoughts constructed of mind we know that only after waking up while we are dreaming of course it seems very real to us and that's one 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 kind of experience so that you are the dreamer and your dream world another kind of experience is seems to be no experience at all it's a, an, an experience of blankness deep sleep and uh, the upanishads introduces these three are common to us we know we know it open the upanishad just points it out with the purpose of pointing out one thing the real teaching of the upanishad is actually you are not the waker experiencing a waking universe rather you are one consciousness turiyam which appears as the waker and the waker's universe which appears as you the dreamer and your dream universe which appears as you the deep sleeper and the merged causal blankness of the deep sleep so the gross universe subtle universe and causal universe they are all appearances of one consciousness which is turiyam and that is the that is what you really are what we all really are that is the grand theme of the upanishad and uh, the investigation into the self is supposed to reveal that the second kind of investigation second second part of the teaching is that om the sacred syllable om sacred sound om um uh, is used as a kind of shorthand to understand this teaching um it said that just as the self has four aspects in sanskrit four pada four aspects waker dreamer waker and waker's universe dreamer and dream universe deep sleeper and the deep sleep merge darkness the darkness of deep sleep and turiyam the re- the real consciousness which is behind all of them similarly notice the upanishad said om the sound also has four aspects four four letters in it so to say actually three letters and silence what are the three letters of om you might say om looks like two letters to me but remember in the o two letters are merged in there a and u in sanskrit when you uh, chant them together they become o so a u m the three three letters a one u two m m three and the silence which follows since you have these four letters for four matras they are called matras four, four letters three matras and one silence four matras of om 
and four paths of the self it naturally suggests that you can actually map them um, the upanishad suggested that you should associate in your mind the sound a uh, give it the name the waker and the waker's world give it the name a uh. the dreamer and the dream world give it the name u and the deep sleeper and the deep sleep causal darkness give it the name m mm. all right and the turiyam the real consciousness itself yes come on in come on in come come consciousness in itself turiyam yes uh, build uh, you consciousness in itself will can be represented by the silence which follows the om a u m and then silence a can be used to represent the waker u to the represent the dreamer and upanishad said m the last part can be used to represent the deep sleeper and the silence following this sound can be used to represent turiyam why would you want to do this this is a good way of contemplating the entire teaching instead of reading the whole upanishad each time and thinking about everything just say om with the understanding of your entire experience of life and see how it appears in one consciousness which you are it becomes easier and easier to understand yourself as the one consciousness in which you experience the whole of life by whole of life i mean waking dreaming and deep sleep. having said these things now the upanishad is coming to a conclusion the 12th mantra the final mantra will come where it will speak about the silence remember in the 8th mantra 9th mantra 10th mantra and the 11th mantra the upanishad spoke about how you can map a to the waker in the i think in the um uh, 10th mantra it spoke about how you can map u to the dreamer Uh, how you can map in the 11th mantra it spoke about how you can map m to the deep sleeper and finally in the 12th mantra which is coming now the upanishad will match silence with pure consciousness and suggest that you are the pure consciousness turiya you are that silence also that silence pure consciousness is what we really are in which all these experiences appear in which the silence in which all speech comes all words come and the uh, consciousness in which all objects are experienced so now karika number 22 and 23 let's quickly read those before we go on to the 12th mantra the karikas are the comments given by gaurapada the great master shankaracharya's teacher's teacher these are comments actually observations given on the upanishad's teachings by gaudapada 22nd he is commenting on this right now he is commenting on this meditation a u m meditation remember this whole om meditation is not really the central teaching of the upanishad the central teaching of the upanishad is on this side of the uh, of, of this chart the waker dreamer deep sleeper and turiyam कारिका नंबर ट्वेंटी निश्चित सपूज्य सर्वूता सपूज्य सर्वूता वंद्यव महामुनि vandyashchaiva mahamuni now the upanishad the, the karika is praising the person who practices this om meditation uh, why would you praise this this is again the style of teaching in the upanishads where uh, a practice will be suggested and a person who practices that 
is eulogized. So this is an, an, an eulogy. If you do a lot of Om chanting, this applies to you. <laughs> what does it mean? Trishu Dhamma. So in the two, Dhamma literally means the holy place, you know. Vedanath Dham or uh, Kedarnath Dham, the holy places in the Himalayas, and they're called Dhamas. But here the Dhamas mean the three states. And they are holy places. The waking, dreaming and deep sleep. Why would these be holy places? They are. They are actually the holiest of holies. Because they are the places where who exists? Turiya, the pure consciousness, you. You yourself. That's why it makes these places holy. So, the three dhamas, the three states of waking, dreaming and deep sleep. How they are, how they match the sounds. A, U, Ma. That was taught earlier. So what are their common features? Do you remember uh, in each case some common feature was spoken about which helps you to associate? Um, what were the common features? A uh, is, what, is it, what does it have common with uh, the waking state? First. Yes, Adi Aptehe. Adi means it is the first and Apte means it per- pervades. And uh, then U is, what does it have in common with uh, the dreamer? Uh, ubhayatva then utkarshatva it is in between and it is superior superior in between and third one mm, deep sleeper what does it have in uh, common miti apitischa it is like a measure remember the cup into which everything is poured and everything is poured out again it's a colorful example but uh, unforgettable also and uh, Apiti, it is the place of dissolution or the merging of everything else om disappears into mm and uh, waker and dreamer disappear into the deep sleeper. It's a place of merger. It is the causal state. In the cosmic scheme of things, just like your own waking and dreaming disappear into a deep sleep and again emerge from there, in the same way this entire universe disappears into Ishvara. Ishvara is consciousness plus Maya. So the whole universe which is projected by Maya from the Big Bang onwards and everything now. Ultimately, at the end of a cycle, it is supposed to disappear back into Maya. This is according to the principle uh, that effects always merge back into the cause. You know what is creation and destruction, the way they look at it in philosophy, in in, um, uh, Indian philosophy. Creation is when you give a particular name and form to a material. So... um, Podium is created when you give a particular name and form to a log of wood. What is destruction? When the name and form are lost, when it, that, that effect it goes back to its cause. So when it, it's broken, it will ju- you'll just call it wood again. So it was wood and ultimately it will be wood again when the name and form are lost. What Vedanta wants to point out is, even in between it is wood. So right now also, it is all that one pure consciousness alone appears as all of this. Anyway, that apart. Here it says, the one who knows these similarities, A uh, and waker, U and dreamer, M mm, and deep sleeper, that person who definitely knows these similarities and meditates upon them, Sa Pujaha, he is revered, Sarva Bhutanam, among all beings, uh, Vandyascheva, the person is praised, uh, and Mahamunihi is a great sage. So you are a great sage if you happen to chant Om and you know these things. Basically a person who is practicing this, keeping this meaning in mind. Um, come on. The 23rd verse, 23rd Karika. Akaro nayate vishwam, akaro nayate vishwam, ukarascha pitaijasam, ukarascha pitaijasam, makarascha punaf pragyam, makarascha punaf pragyam, namatre vidyate gatihi, namatre vidyate gatihi. This is also part of the result of Om meditation, the 23rd uh, verse. Let me just translate, it will take a little bit of explanation. It's not particularly important, but it gives you a background to what Vedic thinking was like. 
Let me just translate and I'll give you the background then. What did, what did this verse say? The letter A leads to Vishwa, the waker. So the letter U leads to Tejasa, the dreamer. The letter M again leads to Pragya, the deep sleeper. And in the, the silence, Amatra doesn't lead to lead anywhere. It just leads to, it, it's, it's the reality itself. It doesn't take you anywhere. This, the first one takes you to this. Now, here t it is a specific meaning. To give, before I give you the meaning, I'll tell you what, what the whole thing is about. In Vedanta, they speak about two possibilities if you practice Vedanta. What happens after death? Two, poss po two possibilities are there. One is called Videha Mukti, one is called Krama Mukti. Two kinds of liberation. Now, one liberation is what we uh, talk about in the Upanishad. You realize you are Brahman, you are Turiyam, you are liberated. You always were, you just now know it that you always were liberated and you are liberated. That is liberation by knowledge. It's called direct liberation. And that's the whole purpose of Vedanta. So that we can attain that direct liberation. We think we are bound, we realize we are not bound at all. We think we are finite, we realize we are infin inf uh, infinite. So that's the direct liberation. To such a person, what happens after death? The term is Videha Mukti. Videha Mukti means the person is already liberated even while living in the body. When the body goes, to the person the liberation is, there is no difference made to it by the death of the body. It is called liberated without body. Before that, Jivan Mukti, liberated in the body. And when the body dies, in its natural course, liberated without body, Videha Mukti. From the point of view of the person who is uh, liberated, it makes no difference. The person knows I am this pure consciousness, Turiyam. But, apart from this, another kind of liberation is men mentioned in Vedanta, which is interesting. Suppose, in spite of all of this, we do not attain knowledge, Jnana. We do not attain knowledge. In this birth, we will, one day or the other. Suppose now we do not attain knowledge. And then I die, having not attained knowledge. I do not realize that I, am, I may attend, attended a lot of classes and written lots of notes and thought about it, even sort of, sort of understand, understood it. But I truly cannot claim that I am that pure consciousness. I do not feel like that. It's not real to me yet. So I don't really feel that I have attained liberation. What happens to such a person? This is called Krama Mukti, sequential liberation. What happens is, the Upanishads say, this person then goes after death. Everybody goes after death. Going is called Gati. Literally it means going. Going where? According to one's karma, an ordinary person, when the body dies, goes to other worlds, according to that person's karma, and is finally reborn again, in some form again. And that's what we have been repeating again and again and again for ad infinitum. But what kind of liberation is possible? Suppose one does not realize that you are Turiyam. Then what happens to that person? Will that person again go through the cycle of births and deaths? The idea is if that person is sufficiently advanced, not yet liberated, but sufficiently advanced, a pretty saintly good kind of person, pretty spiritually evolved person, not yet fully liberated, then that person goes, also goes, but not to any of the ordinary worlds. Definitely does not come back to this world anymore. What are the other options available? What are the tourist destinations? <laughs> Summer is here. So, if you are a very good boy or a very good girl, after death, uh, a person gets to go, you get to go on this superb cruise and to to the Caribbean or something like that and, and have loads and loads of fun. So that's one kind of um, gati going um, destination. Those are called heavens in with the plural, with, with a small h, not the capital H, the small h. They are worlds, just like this world, but a much better world. So not quite downtown, maybe the upper west or even the upper east, some, something like that. Much, much better. Um, and uh, what are they like? There's no suffering there. 
it's all fun, uh, fun and games. It, the gods live there. It's like uh, um, you, you, there's no problem at all. Nachiketa is told in the Katopanishad that there is no old age, no death, no disease, no want. It sounds great. Why shouldn't we aim for that? Except for one big thing. The problem is it all comes to an end. Just like this world, that also comes to an end. And ultimately it's not satisfying. Because it's also a part of our limited world. Just a finer place. Instead of living in a slum, you get to live in the nice part of town. It's the same town. It's the universe. It's just a more upscale part of town you get to live there. For a while. And then it's over. Why is it over? Because anything produced by karma comes to an end. It runs down. Just as this life, it runs down. At one time, this body will go and you go on to other things. That life also will come to an end. Those are the lower heavens. And there are many of them. In Hindu mythology, they believe in many of these heavens. Not Hindu, just Jains and Buddhists, all Indian thought. So various kinds of experiences you can have. And in fact, in one of the Upanishads, it gives you how much happiness is available in each of those places. Uh, it's an in, in Taittiriya Upanishad. There's something called the analysis of happiness. You say, why didn't you teach us that? That sounds more fun than <laughs> this dry <laughs> philosophy. Yes, it's an analysis of fun. Uh, and says, how much fun can you, how much happiness can you have in this world? It starts off there. And then, what are the other worlds and how much happiness can you have there? In this world, if you look at the description, it's so... Um, uh, so, so interesting, the way they understand human happiness in this world. It says, um, first of all, and here is where I, it gets all the booze. It says that you have to be young. <laughs> so many of the old, I, I, I remember saying this in, in Hollywood of all places. And there were, in the audience, there were lots of booze. And <laughs> uh, because uh, older people didn't like that at all. But it's the truth. It's much easier to have fun you're, when you're young. When you're old, you're just struggling to keep things together. <laughs> so, first of all, the, they're describing the maximum happiness you can have in, on this world. You have to be young. Second, it says, um, highly educated. You can't be a school dropout. You have to be from <laughs> Colombia or an Ivy League. More, if, if possible, a number of PhDs and things like that. And then, not just a bookworm. But it says of good character, uh, a good person, a person who is evil or given to addictions and all makes his or her life a hell. So good person. And then it says good health, a person with all vigor and a powerful body, the capacity it says to enjoy this world. And then it says the person must be extraordinarily rich, uh, must be... Um, <laughs> Like literally the rich, richest person in the world. And it says this is this all of this together. If a person has it, this is the acme of human happiness possible. The possibility of human happiness is this is this much. And it gives this the unit one. This is one unit of happiness. So I don't know where we would be on that scale. <laughs> so it's one unit of happiness. And it says the lowest of the high heavens, of, of the heavens. The first of them, not a very good place, just a little bit better than this world. It gives you a hundred times this happiness, just by going and staying there. And the next one above that, better above means more refined than that, gives you a hundred times of that. And get, then it goes on like this. And I saw up to the highest possible manifestation, the highest possible world called Brahma Loka, the world of Brahman. Not Brahman itself, but the world of Brahman. And there I calculated how much happiness you can get. It was 10 to the power 20 yeah. of that maximum human ha happiness. Now, all these heavens, they come to an end. When they come to an end, you have to come back to this world. And if a person on the other hand of the spectrum, the person is naughty, is, a, is an evil person, then there are other places for you to go to, which are not heaven, they are much worse than this, this, this world. So, there are various kinds of hells, but none of them are eternal. When uh, bad karma is exhausted by suffering, you get to come back here again and work out your uh, karma and your spiritual destiny. The point is, there is a very colorful assortment of destinations available after death. 
none of them permanent. You come back again. Swami Nishreshanji, who, who started our Vedanta work in South Africa, he had these nice stories to explain these, these concepts of temporary worlds you visit. So, he said it's like, he was in South Africa. So, he said it's like, I fly in Air India from Durban to Mumbai. And it's expensive, you purchase the ticket and then you get into the plane um, in Durban and there is a beautiful air hostess who says, come, come, here is your seat of choice. This is actually a literal translation of a, a statement in the Vedas that after death, the transmigrating soul, you are greeted by other beings. It matches a lot of those near-death exp uh, experiences or accounts. You are greeted by other beings, shining beings who say, come, this is the heaven of which you have earned by your pious deeds and takes you to your seat, you know, business class or whatever you have earned and then it installs you there. And then it's nice, it's not hot like uh, it was outside, you know, the climate is controlled, it's very relaxed, you don't have to do a thing and these people come and give you nice food and, and there are movies to watch and all of that and just as you're getting used to it, this is nice, I like this life. It says now we are landing in Mumbai and it is uh, 105 in the shade outside uh, <laughs> and uh, thank you for flying with Air India. And if you say, no, no, I want to stay here, I say, no. You can be free to come back next time. You have to purchase a ticket again. You'll fly with us. We'll welcome you. But not now. Now you have to leave. And you are sent back out. Um, it's exactly like that. In those heavens, when your karma is exhausted, you're sent back here. Or the hells, the various kinds of lower worlds. When suffering is over, you come back again. Now among all of them, there is one highest Heaven. Highest in a sense, the best one, which is a very spiritual world. As you can see, all these other heavens and hells are not very spiritual at all. They are places of enjoyment and suffering. But there is a very spiritual world, which, it's, which it, uh, Upanishads call it Brahma Loka. The world of Brahman. There Brahman refers to Ishwara, God. The world of God, Brahma Loka. Very spiritual persons who are not yet enlightened. They can go after death, they will go there and stay in the company of the Lord and finally attain their liberation from that place, from that heaven. They will not come back here. They may stay there for a very long time in the, um, and have, you know, hang out with God, sort of, for a very, very long time. So, and the Upanishads speak about that, that there, this, this, is a, this is a track which is uh, available, but only for the religiously evolved, spiritually evolved persons, persons who have led a very virtuous and pious life and they will go there. My take on this is, what they are talking about is the heaven promised by religion. Religion promises heaven, but that heaven that religion promises are not those places of partying and having fun and coming back again. Rather, religion promises an eternal heaven in the presence of an eternal God. Christianity promises that. Um, Islam promises that, Judaism in its core form, it, it, it says that there is that, that this uh, highest possible existence. Hinduism, in many descriptions, Vaikuntha, the, the, the heaven of, you live with Vishnu, or Goloka in the presence of Krishna, or Kailasha in the presence of Shiva. In whichever form you imagine God, you conceive of God and worship God, there is a Loka, a world spoken of, which you will attain after death. These are all devotional paths. Um, so if you retain your individuality by some means, if you do retain your individuality, then you will have this experience of Brahma Loka. Okay. So this is what I wanted to say. And that is what is being mentioned here. If a person who practices this meditation and stresses the a u m. That person attains oneness with Virat, Hiranyagarbha, Ishwara. Basically with God. Or stays with God for a very long time and finally attains liberation. But if, you, if this person realizes the meaning of the silence at the end, 
that I am that pure consciousness. That person does not go into any world or attain oneness with God or anything like that. That person is Brahman, is the infinite, remains as the infinite. But the individuality is lost. So this is the background. And now you, this will make sense. <coughs> Those who meditate on Om with a stress on A, they will, after death, they will attain to Virat. It says Vishwa attained Virat. Virat means oneness with the, the physical, the, the gross universe, the God in the Virat aspect. Those who emphasize on U will attain uh, oneness with Hiranyagarbha, the cosmic mind after death. Those who em uh, emphasize the M um aspect of the Om meditation, they will attain oneness with Ishwara, the causal aspect after death. But forget the details. What it basically means is they will all go to Brahma Loka. But those who concentrate on the silence at the end of Om, concentrate means they realize the meaning of that. <laughs> I am Brahman. Na vidyate gatihi. There is no movement after death. What happens when the body drops? The body drops off. For every other, other one, the subtle body, sukshma sharira, it leaves the body. That is called transmigration. For ev every one of us, until we are enlightened, one of the signs of a en fully enlightened person is, after death, the subtle body does not leave the body. The body goes back to the five elements of nature, and the subtle body also goes back to the five elements of nature. There is no individual left behind after that. The Mundaka Upanishad makes it very clear. In the, there is another Upanishad called the Mundaka Upanishad, where it says that uh, when the... En Enlightened being realizes Brahman. When the enlightened being dies after realizing Brahman, the body dies. It's like a river running into the ocean. Very beautiful verse is there. That each of the elements merges with its cosmic counterpart. The earth of the body into the earth, the water into the water, the air into the air, the heat into the fire element, the space into space. And the mind also is constituted of subtle elements, tanmatras. If you read Vedanta Sar, you will know the mind, mana, buddhi, chitta, hankar. They are elements also. In the case of an unenlightened person, that's mind, the subtle body. It goes to other births. That is what is called going from world to world, birth to birth, the cycle of birth and death. But for this enlightened person, that mind also, that subtle body also, merges back into nature. Then what remains? Brahman remains. What about this person? Is he lost? That person remains as the infinite. Was the infinite, remains as the infinite. No gati, no movement. I'll come to you. Yes. Maharaj, um, so when an enlightened person dies, hmm. uh, that means the person, who, the, he loses individuality, small hmm. shape, you know, the So, did Holy Mother uh, say something like kathe putu wooden doll? Did she, what did she refer to? Her? She made a specific statement that they, individual means they remain one with Brahman. They, they, they don't have an active, active individuality there. She meant, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember one interesting story that Swami Suhitananda told us. He served Swami Premeshanandaji for many years. Swami Premeshanandaji was a disciple of Masharada and he was regarded as an enlightened person uh, in his own lifetime. So I became a monk under the guidance of Swami Suhitananda. He is now the, one of the vice presidents of the order. So he told us many stories about Swami Premeshananda. One was about the passing of Swami Premeshananda. Swami Premeshananda was very sick for many years of his life. And towards the end, he was in our hospital in Benares, in Kashi. When, um, some time before passing away, Suhitanji asked for a boon from Premeshananda. He said, I want something. And Premeshananda said, what do you want? He said, first, when you pass away, I don't want them to do to your body what they do. They try to revive the body. And in those days, it was more crude. Cutting and piercing and putting pipes and things like that. In a futile time, attempt to... I don't want all that. You, know, you should not be disturbed. He said, all right. And then one or two other things, very interesting. He asked... Uh, he told me that he asked about Premeshanji, what mantra did you receive from the mother? <laughs> tell me. <laughs> so I asked him, did, did he tell you? He said, he told me a little bit at the beginning and then he said, don't ask anymore. 
And the second, and the, another thing he asked was, do you see Thakur, Sri Ramakrishna? And he said, yes. Do you see it uh, like a picture? Sri Ram, Suryanji was unrelenting. Do you see like a picture or living? He said, living. Wow. <laughs> so that uh, he said. Now, when Premishanji passed away, the interesting thing is, that day he was keeping quite well. I mean, he was better than usual. And um, Swami Suhitananda used to feed him. He had to feed him like a baby because he couldn't eat himself. So, doctor had come and examined him and the doctor was walking across the courtyard and it was time for Premeshanandaji's breakfast. So, Suhitanji was feeding him, which was a kind of gruel, uh, mixed, like, like liquid, in a spoon. And Premeshanandaji was virtually blind by that time. He would sit quietly like a little baby and Suhitanji would feed him. And sometimes he would be obstinate like a child, you know, he wouldn't open his mouth. So, you would have to tell him, open your mouth, one more spoon, one more spoon. And he was not, he was not taking the food. So, Suhitanji told him, one more spoon, Maharaj, open your mouth, take one more spoon. And he felt something is wrong. And he quickly put the spoon down and he rushed to the doctor who was still walking across the courtyard. Doctor, just come and see, the Swami seems a bit strange now. And the doctor came back to see and Swami had passed away. So, Sweetanji said it was just like a clock, you know. The hands of a clock move and when it runs out of, it's, um, it, it's, it, 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 it runs out of, it's winding up, in a, it's unwound completely, spring. it's spraying, it stops. It's like, like this and then it stops. So that was the final thing. And then sometime after the last rites had been performed, in Kashi they don't burn the bodies of uh, monks. They take it to the river and it's immersed in the middle of the river. He went to a great Vedantic scholar, Swami Vishwarupananda, who is to stay in Kashi Sevashram. He said, I had a doubt. I've heard and seen also in the lives of very great monks who passed away, they have visions at the end. You know, the hair stands on the end and they, they see, they, many of them, if they're devotees of Sri Ramakrishna, they have visions of Ramakrishna, the devotees of Krishna or whatever, in whatever form they have worshipped God, that form they experience at the time of death, at the time of passing. Um, but in Swami Premeshanjan's case, nothing just stopped and yet he was regarded as such a high spiritual soul by everybody, one, one and all. So he had a doubt. What was this? And so he went and asked Swami Vishwarupananda and that Swami said, Oh, don't you know what you are telling me is amazing? Don't you know what happened? Then he pointed him out to the Upanishads. Go and look there. It clearly says, for a Brahma Jnani passing is exactly like this. Na gati vidyate. All the others are signs of gati. And that are having a vision of Krishna or Ramakrishna or something, then you go to Brahma Loka and go to heaven and stay in the presence of God and finally maybe attain Brahma Jnana. Ultimately, you will attain Brahma Jnana. They are all mukti, they are all moksha because you don't come back again to this world. They will, these people will never come back. But one is liberated forever, has no individual existence anymore, is one with Brahman. The other one is a very exalted kind of individuality remains in heaven in the presence of God. So the great saints of most religions you would expect, they are like that. The great devotees, bhakta, those who love God and would prefer to maintain a little separation between oneself and God. So they will maintain an individuality. And they have these extraordinary experiences at the time of death. So I said this to point out, na gati vidyate, there is no going for those who realize the silence after death after Rome. For everybody else, there is going. But this kind of going is um, something very exalted. It's a highly spiritual. High, it's only for people who, are, who have led the most pious kinds of lives, are completely devoted to God in some form or the other. <coughs> so these, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, these are enlightened uh, souls? See, from a close to... cl very close, may not be fully enlightened in the sense of I am Brahman, but definitely they are enlightened in the sense of, say, bhakti, for example. God exists, I am completely devoted to God, is very real to them. And so they exist with God. So the first three parts of this uh, 23rd verse are kind of a little uh, separate from the Advaita, would you say that? It would be, from an Advaita point of view, it would be a lower result. But the real result Advaita is pushing towards is this. And this lower result is achieved at the point of death. 
You go from this existence, a very saintly existence no doubt, to an existence in heaven. I see it that way and I see that, see, how this provides a foundation to religion. Most of theistic religion promises something like this. Lead a very good life, be a devout person and you go to heaven. You still are a person. You still have an individuality, an exalted individuality, a pure individuality, the individuality of a devotee. So that, it makes room for that. It does not dismiss all of that. But that's still in the realm of maya, of appearance. Not that that person will ever come to any, any harm. That person will only go higher and become enlightened finally. But uh, there are others, and that's what the Upanishad is trying to teach you. Realize yourself as Brahman here and now. And this is what, the silence beyond, a, u, and m. Now we shall try to explain that. Yes, the other smaller heavens, H, which you at small H, which you attain by karma, by being a good boy or a good girl, not not by spirituality. Those ones you come back, and it makes sense. Why? All those other heavens and hells, all those worlds are ruled by desire. I want it. I want it. If you want it, God will give you the chance to play. You want to keep on playing? He'll give you the chance to play. If you don't want to keep on playing, uh, Sri Ramakrishna gives the example of as long as the child is busy with the toys, the mother is busy with her household work. When the child throws away all the toys and uh, yells for the mother, cries for the mother, he says, throws, Sri Ramakrishna would demonstrate, you know, like throwing his hands out, ma, like that. Then the mother puts down her pots and pans and comes rushing to pick the child up on, on her lap. That is Brahma Loka. Going to, back to the lap of the mother, where you have given up all your childish engagements. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, so I have such a, as a young man, I have such an anxiety and fear towards old age and what's going to happen. But uh, the practice in Ramakrishna mission that young monks are being older monks. And what was the first boon? Practice. Oh, but everybody becomes older. No, I know, but uh, this, this, uh, no. how can I say? He was asking the first boon is no one should cut your body. Cut your body. Yeah, you should go just like that. Nobody should get a chance to, you know, revive, revive you and, and, and struggle with you. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> because he didn't want, uh, he had served Premeshanji so much. Premeshanji does not m mind what somebody does with his body. But he had served Premeshanji so much for so long, felt that, um, Maharaj should not be disturbed. Yes. Yeah, so that seems amazing. Like that would take off so much load of fear of old age. That you die suddenly? Love, if you can love another old man so much. Hmm. Or oh, if you can love another old person so much? So yes. Much. Serving uh, people. One of the practices which we often do. And we take every chance to serve the old monks. Old and sick monks and who need service. Um, we tend to take every opportunity to do that. In our main monastery, um, people would, the younger novices would compete to do that. It is full of blessings. It's very, it's very full of blessings. I mean, the real blessings is it takes you Godward. That is the real blessing of a, of a sadhu. It takes you Godward. The lesser kind of blessing is it makes your life a happy life. People think that that's the real blessing. In India, it's a feeling. Sadhu, sadhu seva, you, you serve a monk, so that you get the blessings flow from that. But most people use these blessings to let my loans be paid off, let my disease be cured, let my son or daughter get a job or get married off and so and so forth. Uh, but those are um, lower uses because they all come to an end and they really do not give you lasting happiness. The wise ones ask for devotion, for uh, jnana, bhakti, vivek, vairagya. Oops! Ma Maharaj fell down. No, just, 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 he just fell. Maybe it's a bill. No, no, I think he just... Just take a look. I think he... Mm. he I think he felt uh, sleepy. Mm. Please sit. It's, it's, I think he's, he's up already, yeah. He's up already. Please sit. Yeah. No, he didn't stand. He just, I, I just saw that. He, he slipped off and fell. He slipped off the chair and fell. 
Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, it, I think it, it dozed off and. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah, that's what happened. Yeah, that's just good. Hmm. No, you're sitting. He did not get up. It's a. Uh, don't worry. It is a. Uh, Mandukya has that effect. <laughs> one of the side effects of Mandukya. You're going to slap. No You too. Just a heavy lunch. <laughs> Check him for bruises afterwards. Yeah. Yes. So uh, there was a question about. Um, Yes. And Bill just gave you gave you the opportunity now. <laughs> Bill gave you the opportunity right now. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's all right. Yes. So we would always take the opportunity. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and I saw what happened. Uh, we always uh, would take the opportunity of serving these uh, old monks, and we'd always ask for blessings that. For, for progress in spiritual life. Yeah. Um, I, I remember, I did that so many times. And one funny incident where I, I remember once, when, when my first visit to the main monastery in Belur as a new novice, young novice, I saw after breakfast, the young novices would all rush, the brahmacharis, to take the bowls, we all had little bowls for, for food. So to take the bowls from the older monks and wash them and, and keep them so that the older monks wouldn't have to do that little uh, chore themselves. Now, I didn't have the courage to go up to an older monk. So I went up to a novice and I grabbed his bowl <laughs> and I said, give me your bowl, I'll wash it for you. <laughs> and, and he said, no, that's all right. And I said, no, give it to me. I kept tugging at it until he in exasperation said, but I haven't eaten yet. <laughs> so... <laughs> I was taking his bowl away. He was about to go and eat. I was taking his bowl away. Before. <laughs> yeah. I remember talking with this um, another senior monk, very intellectual, very good speaker, and good administrator, and so on and so forth. And he pointed out a very senior monk who was at that time um, just over a hundred years old. He just pointed out that monk and said, "Do you see Upen Maharaj?" And I said, yes, if I have even, uh, if I can even get a fraction of the spirituality he has got, I'd happily roll in the dust on which he walks. You know, so if I could, by that, if I could get even a fraction of the spirituality which he has got. Okay. Yes. If you don't go to Brahmaloka, but yeah. you go to one of the lower heavens. Yes, don't. Yeah. No, no, but if somebody comes back, <laughs> yes. then the person doesn't begin at uh, ground zero. No, it? no, it doesn't. doesn't. That is the question in the Bhagavad Gita. In the sixth chapter of the Gita, Arjuna asks this precise question to Krishna. What happens to a person who is not enlightened? Suppose I walk on the path that you are showing me, but it clearly is a possibility I will not attain enlightenment in this particular life then is it all lost? I could have spent my life doing something else in the world, that time and energy. So is it all lost? Do I have to begin from the wall? Be Imagine starting with Mandukya Upanishad all over again. And <laughs> Krishna says no. He said, a person who walks on this path, it's called, he, he calls it the path of auspiciousness. A person who walks on this path never comes to a bad end. What will happen to a person who has not attained? person going to Brahma Loka does not come back also. That person is considered to be liberated already. But suppose you don't go up to that level also. You go to one of the higher, um, because you are practicing spirituality, you generally tend to be a good, better person, a good person. So he says such persons after death, they will go to the higher heavens, not the highest heaven from which you do not come back, but the higher heavens, having sp spent, he says, thousands of years there. Uh, Ushitwa Shashwati Sama, many years, long years, he says, having spent long years there, will come back again to this world, 
Shuchinam Srimatam Gehe Yoga Bhrashta Bhijayate will be reborn in a good family. You get your parents who are good people. It doesn't say particularly spiritual people. It just says good people. Shuchi means, um, uh, you know, decent people. And it also says prosperous. It, it, it won't, you won't be very poor. You might not be millionaires, but you won't be very poor either. Basically, it means it will give you a good base to start all over again. What happens when you are born into such a family? He says, by the force of past practices, riyate hi avasho apisa, that person will be pulled along helplessly. Not that you will remember uh, Mandukya Upanishad suddenly and wake up with a cold sweat. <laughs> but no, no, but it will attract you. Whatever form of religion or spirituality, genuine religion or spirituality you find in your society, in your locality, um, it will pull you powerfully. It could be any form of spirituality. Basically, they are all paths leading to the same reality. And it says that person will start practicing from wherever he or she left off, helplessly. You cannot not walk on this path, will walk on this path. And that's, and it says like this, this person goes on until he attains, this person attains liberation. Yeah, I'll come to you. You. Shraddha. Uh, Shraddha is uh, it's a Sanskrit word meaning the funeral rites which you perform for departed ancestors. So one reason, one of course is a psychological reason for letting go for, for the people left behind. But the other is this one. For those who are transmigrating, having left the body, my father, mother, grandparents and so on and so forth, let them have a higher gati, a, a higher path. It, they will go according to their karma. But your prayers and your worship and the rituals that you perform on their behalf adds, that's the belief, adds to their store of good karma. It's a booster rocket you strap on <laughs> so that they can go a little higher, maybe to a better world. So you pray for that, Shraddha. So that's what um, Hindus, traditional Hindus, they believe in that. So they do it for their prayer. But every culture you will have, you'll see it has prayers for the dead. They even talk in terms of helping to make the transition and so on and so forth. It was once explained to me that uh, time in this other loka is a lot longer than time here. Mm -hmm. There is a, a, yeah. a year of our time is a day in their uh, Right. World. So, uh, time distortion. Because, you see, even in this paradigm, huh, years might go away in your uh, dream. Right? And uh, when you come back to this world, you have just one night has gone. The Narada and Krishna story sh shows how in Maya, Narada spent a whole lifetime, 20, 30 years, and raised a family. While Krishna was waiting for half an hour. You know the story is there, he's waiting for a drink of water. When he comes back, Krishna says, you've been gone for half an hour. Yeah. So time, time distortion. <laughs> but we experience it ourselves. The moment you change the state of awareness... From waking to dreaming to deep sleep. Waking and dreaming, there is time. But different scales of time altogether. Deep sleep, no movement of time. Psychological time is not there at all. When you are experiencing deep sleep, unless the mind works, time will not be experienced. Yes. Is there? Don't worry. <laughs> but so, how is it possible to shorten the period to liberation for us? See, two things. One is, I must want it. This eagerness must be there. And the second one is grace. Grace. It is the Guru's grace. It is God's grace. So, grace is very powerful. And but you must want it also. You must want it. What do I want? If you want, you'll have it because you are it. The other, this heaven, that heaven, it, you have to earn it with your credits, with your points, you know, which you've got on God's bank. But here you don't have to earn it. It is you. You just have to realize it. But you have to want that. We, d we generally want things in this world. As a limited being, I shall enjoy a higher heaven. And that's what traps me in samsara. 
I will be a limited being. I will not die. I will live longer. I will not be sick. I will be healthy. I will not degenerate and be old. I will try to be young. And I want to remain in a particular state, a limited state. And so I struggle all my life. It will never work. It has never worked for anybody. But then it keeps me coming back again and again and again. They are, if you ask Guru's grace or God's grace, Sri Ramakrishna said, our grace is always there. Kripar Batash Bhoiji, the grace of God is always there. He says, raise your sail. Those little boats which sail on the, on the Ganga, if you go to Dakshineshwar, even now you will see. Little boats and they raise the sail and it catches the wind over the river and it moves faster. So he says, that wind is always blowing. If you raise your sail, you will move faster. Raising your sail is the making the effort. Sadhana, making the effort and wanting it, asking God for it. Yes. So the Sadhu Bhagavad Gita transmigrate for most people who are not, for everybody that's not enlightened. Yes. It also talked about that particular category where you know, they're close to liberation, hmm. uh, but they haven't yet crossed it. So close to liberation means those who go to Brahma Loka. Yeah, and not the ones that do come back. Yes. Hmm. Then for most people, the desire for liberation will get stronger. Because you will remember past birth, sufferings or you know, futility of it all. So if subtle body does get transmigrated, then at least in people who have done a certain amount of good deeds, why won't there be a stronger memory of the past birth to enhance the liberation? You might say that it, she says the memory of past births, would it lead to a greater desire for liberation? You would think so. But you are spiritual folk. That's why you think so. If I could remember many lives, I would be encouraged to get liberation in this life. But a person with strong desires, if that person remembers past lives, will become curious about past lives. What I was, where I was, can I recover some of that bank balance and property <laughs> and use it in this life? Who was my mom and dad and my beloved people in those past lives? It is again samsara multiplied all over again. That person will not ask for liberation. We'll find it so fascinating, we'll get, get caught up in that. Actually, you think like that because you have a spiritual urge. So you think memory of past lives might encourage me to become more spiritual. Practically, it does not. Uh, I think it was Sister Niverit or Christine who asked Vivekananda, how can I get memories of past lives? He said, sufficient unto the day the evil thereof. You cannot manage the sufferings of one life. And you are asking about your past lives. He said, it, it will not help. We may not be able to manage and that's the very nature of memory. Think about it. What did you have for lunch um, on this date last year? Last week? You can sort of barely guess. Yeah, I guess it must have been this. We don't remember. And it's a blessing that we do not remember. Because it's really of no use. You might think that if I remember all the experiences of past lives, it is of use. It will create, make me more deep and spiritual. It won't. What is of use is not memory. What is of use is samskara. Your inherited characteristics and tendencies. After a lot of suffering in many lives, a kind of aversion to worldliness comes in me. That is very useful. I may not remember any of those lives, but in this life, I don't like that sort of thing. So there is no pull. Is memory is it's the lesson that the soul learns through many experiences. The particulars are lost. For example, Krishna never says, when you come into another birth and you have spiritual <laughs> tendencies, will you remember all the verses of the Gita which you struggled hard to memorize? Will you have all the notes of the Mandukya with you? No. None of that will remain. Uh, though the memories might be there, but it, they will, you will not be able to recover them. But... He does say that, Arjuna, the difference is, you don't, you don't remember your births, but I do. He does. Yeah, he does. But that's for, that's for Krishna. And, um, but not for everybody else. No, but what, what remains over is much more valuable than memorizing a few verses or having some notes of Vedanta classes. What remains is the essence of that teaching. That next time you come across those teachings, a similar kind of teaching, uh, spirituality, existence of God, I am not the body-mind, it will seem real to you. Immediately you will take to it. Other times, you may, earlier lives, you may, might have had to struggle. 
Yeah. Deja vu is a strong feeling of having repeated that particular experience. Yeah. Here, it's a tendency. You may not remember, but you like it. Um, Sri Ramakrishna said, those who are going to be spiritual, those who are going to attain God, they will like everything about this place. This place he meant Sri Ramakrishna. Him and his teachings and the things he talks about, the life he talks about, he says those who will attain to God, they will like all of this. There are those who will not be moved by it. So then they are not going to attain God in this life or any, any time soon. So they have to... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then he just gave, immediately gave up. That. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So there are examples in the lives of saints, those who became saints. How they became saints, or a small thing sets them off into an intense spiritual quest. Now, such small things may have happened many times to us. <laughs> uh, it, that the matchstick is, Sri Ramakrishna says, when the matchstick is wet, you, no matter how much you strike it, it might give rise to a little bit of smoke, a couple of sparks, but it does not blaze forth. A dry matchstick, once you strike it, it bursts forth into flame. So the dry matchstick is attained over many lifetimes. Memory may not help. It is experience which helps. What we take away from life is experience, not necessarily memory. Just see in our lives. We, we have done things which we regret and we wish we will not do it. We know it's wrong and we have clear memory of it and we repeat it again. Even with memory, it doesn't seem to stop us. But what stops a person may not have memory, just doesn't like doing such things. That person won't do it. Samskara is more important. I remember once I was telling another monk, a friend, Swami Vivekananda's complete works. I read large portions of it as a kid. I was 9 or 10 years old. I loved it. But I was saying that I, uh, I don't know what I understood in those days. Now I'm beginning to understand a little bit. and um, But... Uh, I don't know, I was a little, little kid. I don't think I understood much. Then that Swami said, Jo hona tha, wo tabhi hua hai. What, what was to be achieved has been achieved at that time itself. It shows that liking itself, that's the essential thing. <coughs> Why did you have liking for a mass of words written or spoken by a, a monk hundred years ago? It's that, that pull. That shows genuine spirituality. What you are doing now, yes, you are understanding it intellectually now. That's good. You should. You need to grow up and understand it. Yes. Um, I have a question about this lifetime. Mm. And that is that uh, if the, the basic teaching of Advaita is that consciousness is everything. Is everything. Then how does someone who is not liberated and not young and not rich, <laughs> how does somebody like that use that lesson, that fundamental lesson to deal with the, the vicissitudes of, of, of modern life. Right. First, one must be grounded in that lesson, not just read about it and go away with it. Grounded means it must seem real, must grasp that lesson strongly. Then use that light in day-to-day -day life. Say, for example, I'll give you a very interesting insight. You lose your temper. That person behaves rudely to you and you lose your temper with that person. You, have a, you hold a grudge. Uh, that person is bad and he said nasty words to me and I don't deserve it. And some people are just awful. You go away saying those things in your mind. But now, suppose you suddenly wake up sitting on your bed and you realize all of that was a dream. All of that was a dream. The person who behaved like that and um, you and the experiences, the thoughts you had about that person, all were dreamt and you are, none of that really happened. That person and that behavior and all of that was nothing other than you, the mind. It was in your mind. Will you still retain an irritation about for a non-existent person? That person in the dream does not exist. It is none, nothing other than your mind. You will not retain any kind of irritation for that person. Nor will you count that as any of any importance. Now in the waking state, what it says is, you the Turiya, the one consciousness, in that alone, just like a dream, this body and the rest of us and this universe is appearing. It's all in you. Whom will you hate? What will you reject? What do you have to run after here? 
if that's that's the stand it's a very high stand to take many of the problem most of the problems of life you can deal with much more effectively than you would otherwise so the dream paradigm is, is a very yes thing. dream paradigm is very important to understand the consciousness paradigm just as everything in the dream is in your mind the dreamer's mind everything in this waking i'm not saying is in the waker's mind no this is something we must realize we'll see come to that but it's an interesting insight i'll transfer here i'll tell you in hindi and then tell you in english uh, one swami teaching the open mandukya in, in uh, the himalayas he, he said this jaise aap swapna purush nahi hai aap swapna drashta hai वैसे ही आप जागृत पुरुष नहीं है आप जागृत अवस्था के दर्शना है वेरी पावरफुल इन साइट वट डज इट मीन ही सेज जस्ट एज यू आर नॉट द पर्सन इन द ड्रीम यू आर द ड्रीमर यू आर दैट पर्सन हु सॉ दैट होल ड्रीम एंड इंक्लूडिंग दैट लिटिल पर्सन इन द ड्रीम हु थॉट यू वेर यू राइट यू इन द ड्रीम एंड द पीपल इन द ड्रीम एंड द होल वर्ल्ड ऑफ द ड्रीम यू आर द सीयर ऑफ द होल थिंग now that's not the teaching of advaita that's an example it says exactly like that you are not the person who is awake now you are rather the consciousness which is the experiencer of the whole waking state what a powerful insight what a liberating insight you know the person will do its own thing but you are not it you are the ground on which this game is happening you are liberated from it you are entirely free from it I'll repeat the Hindi. जैसे आप जागर स्वप्न पुरुष नहीं है आप स्वप्न अवस्था की दृष्टा है जस्ट एज यू आर नॉट द नॉट द पर्सन इन द ड्रीम यू आर द सीयर ऑफ द होल ड्रीम एग्जैक्टली लाइक दैट आप जागृत पुरुष नहीं है आप जागृत अवस्था के दृष्टा है यू आर नॉट द पर्सन इन द वेकिंग यू आर नॉट द वेकर यू आर द विटनेस ऑफ द एंटायर वेकिंग एक्सपीरियंस विच इंक्लूड्स द वेकर नन ऑफ दम आर रियल you are the the seer you is alone real just as in the dream none of the none of it is real except you the dreamer okay now let us go on to the 12th the let us conclude the upanishad 12th mantra this is the last mantra of the upanishad remember the text has two parts one is upanishad one is karika upanishad is the original teaching mandukya upanishad the ancient mandukya upanishad only 12 mantras and we are going to conclude it today and the karikas are commentaries written in verse form by gaurapada in four chapters this is the first chapter the other three chapters do not have the upanishad in them they are gaurapada's observations and insights regarding what we have learned so the real fun starts then you know many interesting things will come the dream paradigm the entire second chapter is based on the dream paradigm um it can be scary at first but it's very liberating when you go through that many insights will come into life which you can use godapada draws all of them out slowly now the end of the upanishad is going to talk about silence what a contrary thing to say talk about silence <laughs> this one oxymoron 12th please repeat after me अमात्रुर्थ अव्यवहार्य प्रपंचोपशम शिवोद्वैत ओंकार आत्म संशति आत्मना संशति आत्मना वेद द वन हु रियलाइजेस द साइलेंस एट द एंड ऑफ ओम अ ऊमा एंड द साइलेंस दैट इज कॉल्ड अमात्र मात्र प्रथम अमात्र द्वितीय मात्र तृतीय मात्र एंड अमात्र the the silence at the end of the om that is the fourth what are the three a u m a remember we are not talking about waker dreamer and deep sleeper right now we are talking about a u n m a u m a there's a three and then the fourth amatra it is beyond all transaction it is uh, it is the silence of the universe it is auspicious it is non dual 
This is Omkara, this is the real Omkara. What is the real Omkara? Not Om, silence. And this Omkara is you, the consciousness. The one who realizes this, realizes consciousness by consciousness and is free. So this is the meaning of the um, Upanishad. Now let us understand this. It will be pretty easy to understand. I'll quickly go through it. The secret is this. Words express objects. In Sanskrit, pada, padartha. Pada means word. Padartha means the object meant by that word. See, when we say meaning, we have a further complication. When I say bus, bus is a word. When you say what is the meaning of bus, you can do two things. One, you can go to a dictionary and give me some more words. Look up the word bus and give me more words. Though that's an explanation of the word bus. Or you can point out a bus out there and say that's a bus. So when we say meaning of the word here in this context, it means the object itself, not the dictionary meaning. So uh, words have their reference. Reference means the thing they point to, not the dictionary meaning, but the thing they point to. So cloth or a shirt, the word is a shirt. And what it points to is this. This is the object. Now, what we have done here is, we have given names to objects. All our waking experiences, you the waker and your entire waking experience is given a name. Ah. Uh, that's one. Then all your dream experiences and you the dreamer, all of it together is given the name U. And the deep sleeper and the deep sleep experience is given the name mm. Okay, Now let's uh, think about this. Go back to the example of gold and ornament. We have four names. One is bangle, one is necklace, one is ring, one is gold. Right? But upon examination, look at the, four, uh, look at the first three names. Bangle, necklace, ring. Right? They correspond to the ornaments. But when you examine the ornament, you find, you examine the bangle and you find that all of it is what? Gold. Every bit of it is gold. So the fourth name gold applies to the bangle. Then what happens to the name bangle? What does it apply to? There is no object called bangle apart from the gold where you can use the name. The name has its use, that it refers to a particular form of gold, particular kind of ornament. But what about the substance? The substance is gold only. So when the object is reduced to gold, the bangle is reduced to gold. The bangle reduced to gold means, remember, all of this is in clear understanding, not physically. You are not melting the bangle down to gold. You just realize it's just gold. The bangle is just gold. When you realize that, you have negated, follow this carefully, you have negated the object. When you negate the object, then the name has nothing to refer to. The name bangle, what does it refer to? You say, why? It's there. Here, here it's a bangle. But this gold, gold says it's my object now. The word gold says it's my, I, I am this thing. You find your own object. The word bangle has nothing to refer to. It's left objectless. Hmm? So it, it's left objectless. It is no object which it can refer to. That's the negation of the word. Negation of the object, negation of the word. Negation of the object is to discover it's nothing other than the reality, the substance. And negation of the word is, once there is no object for it to refer to, the word becomes useless. Useless, as, I mean... Practically, it's still useful. You can still refer to that ornament by saying it's bangle. But you know it doesn't refer to a separate substance called bangle. It, gold is the only substance. So, object negated. Bangle, object, the, the ob object itself is negated by seeing that it's only gold. There's no thing called bangle. The word bangle is negated because there's no object for it to refer to anymore. So... Exactly like that. The word necklace does not refer to any object because the necklace, there is no necklace apart from gold. The word ring does not refer to any object because there is no ring apart from the gold. The word gold refers to the reality which is there in all the three ornaments. 
all the words are negated, bangle, necklace, ring are negated, all the objects are negated. The objects are negated by finding the one reality gold. All right. In the same way, now, when you look at waker, dreamer, deep sleeper, waker in the waker's world, dreamer in the dream world, deep sleeper and deep sleep, uh, deep sleep, uh, causal uh, state, one pure consciousness alone appears as all of this. Apart from the names and forms, what, what is the substance there? It is only pure consciousness. There is nothing here apart from pure consciousness. There is nothing here apart from pure consciousness. There is nothing here apart from pure consciousness. Dream paradigm. Just as there is nothing in the dream apart from the dreamer's mind. All people, all events, all things which happen in the dream is just your mind. Appearing and vibrating in all those ways. In the same way, here also there is nothing apart from the turiyam. Appearing in all these ways and giving us all these experiences. It alone appears as the waking universe and as the waker and experiences all these things. Yes. I think I heard you say something like this once. Um, I've said it so many times. <laughs> this is the central teaching. Yes. What I'm about to say is that, huh. is that everything that can be experienced is not real. Huh. Everything that is not experienced is real. Mm, not that everything that not experienced is real. The real never appears. The uh, what appears is not real. That's what I might have said. That is a quote from Bradley, the philosopher Bradley. Hmm. What appears is a good point. What appears is the waking world. But the reality of this waking world is Turiya, which does not appear out there in front of you. Its appearance is this. Right. Now, the moment you reduce the waker... And the waking world to Turiya. You see, it's nothing other than Turiya. Then what does a uh, refer to? Nothing. You, when you negate the waker and the waker's world. Negating means it still remains exactly as it is. You realize it is nothing but you. It's not a world out there. It's nothing but you, the pure consciousness. In that case, what does a uh, refer to? Nothing. So when the waker's world is negated... The term used for the waker's world, a, uh, disappears into silence. The waker in the waker's world is nothing other than pure consciousness. A uh, is reduced to silence. Similarly, the dreamer in the dreamer's world is nothing other than pure consciousness. Turiya. U is reduced to silence because there is no real dreamer in dreamer's world apart from um, consciousness. So, U has no referent. No thing to refer to. Similarly, M has no thing to refer to because deep sleeper and the deep sleeper's darkness is nothing other than pure consciousness. Substantially. In appearance, so many things. But substantially. So substantially, it is pure consciousness alone. In that case, M has nothing to refer to. A, U, M are negated. When you remove words, what is left behind is silence. When you remove language, it's not just a, u, m. All words, because whatever language refers to is in our universe. This universe, waking universe, dream universe or the deep sleep. Entire, the business of language is the world of duality. When the world of duality is seen to be an appearance, the non-dual turium alone is real, then what will language refer to? It does not really refer to anything. So, it, language disappears. It is silence reigns. That silence, it's not a physical silence which it refers to. That amatra means the silence, the fourth. It's not a physical silence. Rather, it is consciousness itself. That silence consciousness, mm, the silence consciousness is what remains. What, is, what you found to be turiyam here, you find to be silence here. That silence consciousness is you, the real you. In you, the silence consciousness appears the waking world and the language uh, and all the words used to refer to objects in the waking world. Hmm. But really, what is there in the waking world? Turiyam. Really, what do those words refer to? Nothing. It, it is silence alone. So the silence alone is left behind. And that silence is spoken about. Remember the seventh mantra of the Upanishad, which spoke about Turiyam? 
Now the twelfth mantra is speaking about silence and in exactly the same terms. Amatra. Amatra means the first three letters and the silence after that. Chaturtha, the fourth. Just like this was called the fourth. In the seventh mantra it was called the fourth. This is the fourth. Abhyavaharya. This is beyond all transaction. Where do transactions happen? Where do dealings happen? Where, where are things happening? Waking and dreaming. Even deep sleep, nothing is happening. So, no, beyond transactions. This is beyond speech. Abhyavaharya. You cannot speak about it. It is one. All usage stops here. All language stops here. Distinctions of language are lost here. Imagine somebody speaking Chinese, somebody speaking Hindi, somebody speaking English. If you listen to them, they are all different. But if all of them stop speaking, silence. There is no Chinese silence and no Hindi silence and no English silence. It's just silence. So, Abhyavaharya, Prapancho Pashama. It is the silence of the universe. When the things of the universe are seen to be nothing other than pure consciousness, all linguistic usage at the background of it is silence alone. This is Prapanchopashama. It is the silence of the gross universe, subtle universe, deep sleep universe. You say deep sleep universe is silence anyway. No. It is a potential silence. It's a latent silence. It's the silence of the seed. It will sprout into a very busy tree. It's happening there in the Central Park even as we speak. Within two days, it's all full of leaves and everything. It sprouts. It's there. It's full of the potency there. But Turiyam is not, is not potential. It's not causal. It's it, it is beyond static and dynamic. It is the one existence. Prapancho Pashama. Shiva, auspicious. So silence is golden. Auspicious. <laughs> yeah, it's speech which causes all trouble. Advaita, non-dual. See, these three universes are not separate from Turiyam. They are not a second thing. You can't count one, two, three, four. Actually not. One appearing as three. You can't count four ornaments. Gold, um, um, bracelet, ring, necklace, gold. No, 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 no. Wrong, wrong. If you are going to bring gold into the equation, it's only one. It is gold. As ornaments, three separate things. But as gold, only one thing. Because the same gold is these three ornaments. You can't say these are different universes. But no, it is Turiyam alone. There is no second thing apart from Turiyam in the waking world, dreaming world or deep sleep world. It is the one non-dual reality. In the same way, this silence alone is non-dual. The a, uh, u, and m mm sounds are not separate from it. Remember, this silence which we are talking about here is not the silence which is the opposite of noise. I am speaking, hence there is no silence. Rather, it is the silence which is the, the background of, the, the, the ground of all language. Whether you are speaking or not speaking, the background is that. How is that possible? Because it's that consciousness alone. It's not a physical silence. It is consciousness. Evam is non-dual silence. Evam in this way is Omkar. This Omkar. Om, not the A, U, Ma, rather the silence after Om. This silence, Atmaiva, it is the pure consciousness which you are. You are Om. The secret of Om is you, the pure consciousness. If you realize this, what will happen? Samvishati Atman Atmanam. You merge into the Atman by the Atman. Samvishati Atman Atmanam means you merge into the Atman by the Atman. This is a way of speaking. Nothing merges into anything. Yeah. You realize yourself as the infinite consciousness. Yeah. It's not that now I'm 50% merged and 70% merged, 80%, one or two more classes and it'll be done. I'll be 100% merged. Nothing like that. You are it. You are it. So, you realize that once you go through this process. Mm -hmm. Now, there are a few verses which we will do next time. Which concludes the first chapter, verses 20, 24 to 29. These are very easily done. We will do it next time and we will uh, take a review of the first chapter of Mandukya Karika. So next class is important, yes. Swamiji, given 
what you just said about silence hmm. and you know how silence is really I, I realize after AUM the silence that follows and not just the cessation of noise yes but if that is so significant and helps you to you know realize, realize this realize, then why is there also an emphasis on mantras which mantra uh, no, I'm not talking about now. Um, uh, oh, just I see. Generally. Just mantras in yeah, general. Mantras, yeah. Mantra, the term mantra in Sanskrit, it means manana trayatiti mantra. That which you, if you ponder upon that which liberates you. <coughs> A text which you ponder upon it, it liberates you. So the texts related to different forms of God. Kali, Durga, Vishnu, Shiva, they're all called mantras because they enable you to contemplate those divine forms and liberates you, leads you to liberation. Mananatrayate. By thinking on it or <coughs> contemplating on it, it liberates you. See, what we learn from here is all language is basically phenomenal. It refers to the world. So your question is, if it refers to the world and silence alone refers to the highest reality, then why have these mantras? That's the thing. From the point of view of language, language alone traps us in the world. Language alone can liberate you. This, was the, this is the great insight of mantra shastra. If you have tied yourself up with the help of language, it is language alone which can liberate you. <coughs> hmm. When we say body, mind, world, these are words. Having invented these words, we are trapped by them. Why? Because we look for objects which correspond to this. Here is a world. Here is a body. Here is a mind. But what Upanishad tells us is, mind, body, world, they refer to nothing. It is your one consciousness, you alone, which is everything. Now, how do we get out of this tangle? The mantra shastra, the science of mantras, it says language can liberate you. It shows you how language can liberate. In fact, in Kashmir Shaivism, there's a whole science. Advaita does not deal with it. Advaita takes you straight to the final thing. But Kashmir Shaivism, there's a whole science of mantra. Each letter, what potency it has. Each of these mantras, what effect it has on the mind. Language has tremendous effect on the mind. Language generates and sustains this illusion of the universe. Language is the instrument of Maya. And that language, when used... Properly are mantras. It can deliver you. It can free you. Imagine chanting Chidananda Rupaha Shiboham Shiboham. Makes you feel different. What is this? After all, what is this Upanishad also? It is using language to liberate you. So mantras are very useful, very powerful. Yes. All the ornaments, yeah. But, and you also mentioned today that there are no different types of silences. Yes. So silence is only one. Is one. But the, the Buddhist interpretation, Shunya, hmm. nothing. No, it's not nothing. The Buddhist interpretation, that's what I said, mentioned last time. If you look at the Buddhist interpretation, it's not just nothing. That's the wrong way to give, that's the wrong interpretation given or foisted upon the Buddhists by, in fact, us. They say, Buddhists are saying Shunya, ultimately there is nothing. But Buddhists never said that. Is it the same? Are they talking about the same thing? Because I would say so. Yeah. Many Advaitic scholars would not agree and many Buddhist scholars would not agree. But I would definitely think so. And the more you closely follow this, the more the parallels are remarkable. You see, it's like this. Is gold an ornament? Yes. You started out with four things. Mm. The three forms huh. and the material. You know, the are there four things? No, I mean, there's one. Huh. But the others are forms, but you know, you, you have four classes. 
for distinctions, yes. Hmm. Here you have the three um, states, hmm. and if you um, if you think about the, the fourth one, you can say that if you remove the bowl, the, the bangle is not there. You know what is the bangle? Hmm. But you have a fourth one which is bowl, hmm. and it's easy to conceptualize. That. Exactly. But with consciousness, since we cannot describe it, we cannot you know it, it words cannot describe it. So that's where the nothing or the emptiness is a lot easier than it represents everything. So that's why I'm, I'm, you know, I want to get some more clarity on that. I'll, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Look, hold on to the gold and ornaments example. I will show you how the gold is everything and nothing. Take, the, take up the nothing first. Is gold an ornament? It's not an ornament. It's not an ornament. It's not a bangle. It's not a ring. It's not a necklace. The gold in itself is devoid, shunyam of all ornaments. Is it not? There is no, no ornament in a gold. Let me ask you, is the ornament outside the gold or inside the gold? Neither. If there is no real thing called an ornament, it can neither outside nor inside. In fact, the karika will come. The universe, this thurium we learnt about, the universe is neither outside nor inside this thurium because there is no such thing as an universe. So there is no ornament inside, outside, in the gold, nowhere. Therefore you can say the gold is devoid of any real thing called an ornament. In that sense gold is shunyam. It is no thing, no ornament. Shunyam, no means shunyam. It is devoid of all ornaments. At the same time, isn't the gold all ornaments? When you look at it from the point of view of ornaments, what is the bangle? Gold. gold. What is the ring? Gold. What is the necklace? Gold. So it is everything. But in, from another perspective, it is nothing. I mean, it, it is the reality, but it is no particular ornament. It is not a thing among many things. You have many things, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Is the ultimate reality one of them? No. It is not a thing. Yeah. The problem with the gold example is gold is something. Yeah, yeah. I understand what you're trying to say. So, you know, you had mentioned earlier on also that you know there are people who discuss about consciousness and they want objective. And yes. Subjective. Yes. So that's where when you use the gold example, you that, take away, you know, still it's an object right. you can identify with correct, correct. That's, that's the point. But but you know the problem here is we can only use uh, examples and examples of objects. There is only one true subject, which is consciousness. And that cannot be used as an example, because that's the one we are trying to understand. That's the problem that the Upanishads speak. How to explain something for which there is no language? Language is meant for the universe. Language works here, here, even here. Hmm? But language does not work for this. But how will you express it through language, where language cannot work? You can only indicate it. And that indication can be done... Examples are a good way, but examples, as you said, they tend to mislead also. Gold is a thing. So is consciousness a thing like that? Gold is a solid thing, consciousness is a subtle thing? No, consciousness is not a thing at all. But what example can you use? Mathematics. Mathematics is a way, but again mathematics can only point. It cannot directly express. The only advantage we have in this game is, you are that consciousness. So when you actually realize it, it cannot be expressed by language. Even the precise language of mathematics, it cannot be directly expressed by that. It can only be pointed out. And being pointed out like this again and again, say Upanishad, the whole effort was to point it out. If you get it, then what the Upanishad says, samvishati atmana atmanam, that turiyam, that pure consciousness, somehow, we know not how, it realizes itself by itself. I was reading in the gospel, I wish I could read out that line. What happens when you become enlightened? And Sri Ramakrishna says, consciousness realizes itself in itself. Exactly this language. That's the highest enlightenment. And that's you. All these examples can only point. They can be understood or misunderstood. And the misunderstood, that's the skill of the teacher. The teacher has to rule out those misunderstandings. It's not an object. That consciousness we are pointing out, it's not an object. Gold is a thing. That's why the example has been used, because it's easy to understand. 
but it should be understood in only one sense. Gold is the substance behind all ornaments. But gold as an object, consciousness is not like that. But consciousness is definitely the substance of all our experiences. Yeah. Yes. Swami, I understand Om is something I need to associate with the four. Uh, yes. Mm. I, I can associate the first three, but I struggle with the fourth one. The reason I struggle with it is because I understand the three aspects in Vedanta are the like a like a manifestation of the fourth aspect. Hmm. While I'm stuck with this impression that silence is the opposite of sound. yeah. That's so, so here the silence is not seen as the opposite, rather as the ground in which sounds appear and disappear. The background silence is maintained. It's not an opposite that when noise is there, it cancels out silence. Not that kind of silence. And the deep, even the deep physical silence is also always there. We don't notice it. I have seen it. In the Himalayas once, there was a place, which a valley, which is very, very silent. Extraordinarily silent. So I lived there for some time. And um, you know, there at night you can hear there is a bell bird which goes ding dong in the night. Miles and miles away in mountains far away. It sings and you can hear at deep in the night. Just that chime. Of the bird. So it's so silent. Really silent. You could feel. There are monks who have told me. When they meditate. They can hear the roar of blood in their veins. Such such silence. But the interesting thing was. When I came back to the plains. To Lucknow. Which is an extremely busy city. I remember still. Now I was passing an, a busy intersection in Lucknow. Sitting on a rickshaw. For just a while. I felt that absolute silence, exactly the same silence I felt in that valley in the Himalayas. <laughs> Not all places in the Himalayas, some places because of the geographic thing, a very deep silence. I felt that same physical silence in the midst of all that noise. That showed me it's there. It's because our minds are so disturbed that we latch on to noise. We miss out the silence in the background. Physically also silence is there. It's not opposed to noise. Uh, music, musicians know this. It's not only the music produced by these instruments which generates music. Music is actually given structure and existence by the silences in between. Yeah. Musicians know this. If you don't manage the silences, music will dis disintegrate into noise. It becomes music because the silence is managed. Yeah. Um, Alright, one more point. Okay, look at it this way. I'll put it very precisely and you can work it out yourself. You know the whole process, um, Viveka means to separate, the name Vivekananda, to separate, separate in understanding. Two separate things when they appear to be mixed up, if you can separate them in understanding, that's called Viveka. Now let's apply it. Four Vivekas, four Vivekas. And then there will be a culmination. The four Vivekas are this. One is Vishaya Vishayi. Objects of experience and the experiencer. Separate it in your understanding. Try to see. Without trying to separate, we say that here I am the experiencer and everything is experienced. So experience means seen, heard, smelt, touched, tasted, thought about, <coughs> desired, hated. All of these are experienced objects. I am the experiencer. They are all Vishaya. I am Vishayi. But if you look closer, even the body is Vishaya. It's an object. If you look closer, even the mind is Vishaya. So complete, that's the first Viveka. Complete it properly. The whole of Drigdrishya Viveka is just for that one only. That has, there's a central Viveka, central separation in your mind. Experiencer and experienced. Subject and object. Do a very thorough separation of that in your understanding. First Viveka. Then the second and third one you just have to notice. Um, the second and third ones are like this. The second one is that you the experiencer, you will notice that you are permanent and all the experienced things, objects are impermanent, temporary. They are coming and going. Every person in your life, every object in your life, every place in your life, every time in your life, every food that you have eaten, 
Everything is gone, come and gone. Impermanent. They have come and gone to what? You. The, the actual experience of the consciousness. Vishaya, uh, Vishayi, the, the, Vishayi uh, the experiencer, permanent, and the experienced, impermanent. That's the second Viveka, second separation. Just note it. The third thing you notice, notice is, the third Viveka is, the experienced objects are subject to change. They keep changing. It's connected to the first one, they, they, they go away, they come and go, so they keep changing. They're subject to change and modification. You, the experiencer, are not subject to any change. You see, is it a claim or is it, uh, is it a fact? If you understand it clearly, you'll see it's a fact. If, if, for example, ask a question, why is it that I cannot undergo any change? If you undergo any change, do you experience that change or not? If you experience that change, then it becomes an experienced thing, it's not you. You say, no, I can undergo a change without knowing it myself. If you do not know it, why speak about it at all? Yeah. All right. So the experienced keep changing, the experiencer does not change. Hmm. And the fourth Viveka is the experiencer is the truth, the experienced is an appearance. How? That which keeps on changing and the experiencer which does not change, what's the relation between the two? What's the relation between the two? I'm not going into the analysis, there's a very fine analysis there. But what it will finally reveal to you, that which is changing, that which is impermanent, that which is the experienced, is an appearance of the experiencer. You alone, the experiencer, unchanging, Permanent, you appear as the changing impermanent and experience it yourself. I will not give you the details of the analysis. It's simple, but uh, it will take a little bit of time. So this world which you experience is your appearance. Remember, you started off by separating yourself from the world. Now the world has come back into you. So these are the four Vivekas. Vishaya Vishayi or experience are experienced. The Vishaya is permanent, Vishayi, uh, Vishayi is permanent and Vishaya are impermanent. The Vishayi is um, unchanging and the Vishaya are changing. And the Vishayi is true, the Vishaya are false, are appearances of you, the Vishayi. These four culminate in one conclusion. You, the experiencer, are non-dual, a non-dual consciousness. Because you experience, you must be conscious. And because all the things that you experience, changing and impermanent, are nothing but your appearances, like the gold in the ornaments, you are non-dual. There is no second real thing ap apart from you. This non-dual consciousness is called Turiyam. You are this Turiyam. This is the conclusion of the Upanishad. So let's stop here. There are a few karikas which we'll do next time and take a global look at what we have. A sort of review of where we are right now before proceeding to the second chapter of the uh, Mandukya. Today we had a very senior Swami visiting us, Swami Dayatmanandaji from Bourne in London. He just passed through here and he, he has heard in London the people have gone and told him that there's a Mandukya class going on there uh, across the ocean. <laughs> and he was asking why is it not put on YouTube and uh, it should be shared. So there's a lot of demand from outside to put it on. But we are not going to do it the first time around. First time it's only for those who are here. One cycle. And then we will see later on. Next time around. Next life. Or <laughs> <laughs> Om Shanti 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 Hare Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu